G'day everyone, Dicko here with another kick-ass walkthrough. This is part nine of what I can finally say is a 10 part series about modeling for animation. And while this might be the ninth video, this is actually the last video featuring Sophie as a character that we were modeling throughout this series. Because in part 10, we're going to do something a little bit special. And I don't think it's something that's talked about often enough, so that will be fun. But of course, in this video, we are all about Sophie and what's left with her. Well, time has come to talk about her feet. And I say that with humor because out of all the requests I've had during this series, I've had a disproportionate amount requesting me to talk about her feet. <laughs> I don't know what that says about my audience, but I'll just take it as a professional request. And I've wrapped it in here with other things like adding some teeth and a few extra edge loops for the stomach, because these are really extra bits, to be honest. I mean, in most cases that you're going to be building a character, the character's going to be wearing shoes or socks or something like that. So the odds of the character showing their feet is pretty small. So I consider this more of an optional extra for those building characters. But lucky for you, my characters will be showing their feet in some capacity. So I guess you're in luck, feet people. And again, this is not going to be a full on step by step process that I go through when it comes to the feet because the feet are actually quite complicated when it comes to geometry. And in a weird sense, they're actually more difficult than hands to pull off correctly. And that's less to do with the anatomy of the foot and more to do with the topology in terms of edge flow. And as you can see, I've already split the model in half again and mirrored it because obviously I don't want to model the same foot twice. And I'm starting off by just flattening out the base of the foot because I just want to have a nice clean point to start from because obviously when you're rigging a character, you want to make sure that the foot's planted firmly on the ground. And in theory, because you have a nice base to start with, the modeling process should be a little bit easier to deal with. That being said, um, in this video, you will see me sort of construct and reconstruct the foot in different parts because I'm trying to get the right kind of edge flow across the span of the foot. Furthermore, I wanted to showcase in this video the fact that even if I model these sort of characters all the time, there is a large degree of trial and error, problem solving, and mistakes will always be made along the way. It's also the case that every model that you make is different. Every foot you ever make is going to be different depending on the character. So the approach that I'm giving, doing today is reflective of this particular character and the amount of spans I have available to model with. So the case might be completely different with you because you may have modeled your leg and foot a little bit differently to mine. And you may be asking why Dicko, if we were so particular about the spans in the arm and how it reflects down to the hands, why aren't we doing the same for the foot? And that's actually a really, really good question. And ultimately, my answer would probably be yes. Um, it would be better if we had a similar amount of spans going down and around the leg. But there are a few differences to the hand versus the foot. One, there's a massive change in direction, obviously, from the ankle down to the foot. So that's going to change the amount of spans that you have available. Secondly, the large toe, which is basically the thumb on your hand, if you think about it, is facing in the same direction as the rest of the foot. So therefore, you can't just extrude out the big toe as a separate entity like a thumb. They have to travel in the same direction. So therefore, the amount of spans traveling up the foot in the same direction is actually an uneven amount versus the four fingers that you have on a hand. So you're going to have to do a lot of sort of reduction in geometry to avoid those spans traveling up the leg. So that's another problem solving exercise that you need to perform when you're modeling out the foot. And if you're going for a more realistic approach for the foot, so you want to get all the, um, the padding and stuff in the bottom of the foot and on the heel, you may have to build out that geometry as well. But that really depends on the level of realism you're going for and how much you actually give a shit about modeling the foot, especially if you don't plan on showing it very often. Quickly snapping back to the video here in my commentary, um, you can see I'm just really just preparing for my extrusions. I've just sculpted out the structure of the shape of the foot, and now I'm kind of just performing that same pattern I did with the fingers in the hand. So I want to bevel out, you know, a few spans in between to give me some webbing to play with. 
and then I sort of construct that edge loop in the exact same manner as the fingers. And straight away we're encountering a problem that we didn't get with the hands and that is the loop structure is different on the bottom of the foot than it is on the top. And that's down to the way that I extruded out that, that foot structure to begin with. But now I have to sort of think a little bit differently to the fingers in the sense about how and where I sort of join up these beveled edges. So as you can see, there's another problem there. If I add another loop, I'll have to have those spans travel up the body, which I don't want. You can kind of see my thought process happening as I do it. I'm sort of thinking, how do I sort of mitigate that? So I've done an extrusion to add a, another edge loop outwards. So I have some space for that bevel, basically. And as I was doing this, I was thinking, wait, actually, this is actually a really good idea because I'm actually building out that first knuckle without really any extra effort. So you can call this a happy accident or just, you know, sheer luck or just whatever. But ultimately it's me problem solving on the go. And that's a good habit to get into. And you should be thinking about that as you get more and more into the 3D sort of modeling world. You should be able to problem solve on the fly as you encounter them. And you can see here as I'm modeling, I'm kind of trying to follow that same method that I had with fingers and hands at the start of our series here. But, you know, ultimately it's not quite working because I have five spans going up the foot rather than four. And so I'm trying to compensate for that in different ways and it's not working in some, it works in others, but you know. Ultimately, if I didn't need this kind of detail for my foot, I wouldn't really bother doing this. But um, if you are in that position where you kind of have to do that, then again, you have to problem solve with your particular puzzle, essentially. And if you have a very specific look in mind, uh, especially in terms of anatomy, it's really important that you take the time to find that correct kind of reference. And especially between men and women's feet. I mean, God damn, they are so different between one another. It's actually kind of ridiculous how different they are. And obviously the same argument can be made for hands as well, but something about feet that makes it that much more difficult to get right between the genders. It's, it's actually kind of mind boggling how difficult it is. Then of course you have different kind of foot structures. So you've got people with higher arches, lower arches, flat feet, all that sort of shit. So again, uh, when it comes to designing the part of this, this part of the model, think about maybe it's just a stylistic thing. Try and think of a proper style that can match the rest of your character. So if you have a petite light woman, maybe think about how those feet would be structured to carry her weight. If you have a big hulking dude, you know, you maybe you need to build some hulk feet. You never know. Just uh, work through it. And here I am. I'm just trying to close off my loops, trying to get something a bit consistent across everything. But there are still some issues involved with this foot. Namely, there's a degree of spiraling going on along the span of the foot. But I've put that aside for now and I'm working on the actual structure of the toes. And the toes themselves are more complicated than you might think as well. They still have knuckles. They still have mass. They still have padding. And they are not perfectly circular in their structure. So it's a really strange sort of structure to work out. Um, from character to character and it's really easy to create these weird nubby things rather than toes um, so it actually takes a lot of time to try and get that structure looking correct and right now her feet look really tidy and when you look at toes themselves they're actually longer than you might think so think about that when you're designing the toes as well even now the, the length of the foot is just way too long compared to the toes. So I'm gonna be spending some time to rectify that later on in this in this sculpt. And you can see there, there was a bit of spiraling going on. I need to fix that, which is a real pain in the ass. And that's down to that five span issue as well. And that redirection of the, of the spans that I've tried to design. So I'm really trying to make sure that the spans along the length of the foot aren't spiraling in different ways. And you could probably argue that spiraling isn't so much an issue as long as it's isolated within the structure of the foot and doesn't travel up the legs. But, you know, may as well be consistent with my design. I want to make sure that it's a nice clean design. So um, let's try and fix that basically is my mindset. So here I go trying to fix that up. I've actually removed much of the structure of the foot on the bottom and top. And I'm trying to sort of 
puzzle solve my way through it. And, you know, I did actually have to build in another span there. And I think I remove it down the line because I don't like the fact that I added that much geometry to the body again. And again, here I go, just, just try to work things out, try to work out where I can avoid that spiraling going through the structure of the foot. And there are some places where you could probably get away with redirecting the flow of the toe, namely on the edge of the big toe, because the knuckle actually expands outwards to the side on the, on the big toe. So that's probably where you can probably fill in some extra geometry if you needed to sort of redirect some of that geometry. Um, that's a good hiding place for that, for instance. And you can see I just fixed up the, um, the flow there, and now the flow is nice and consistent because I added that redirection there in the toe, in the big toe. And of course, as you can see here as well, you can see I'm trying to find creative ways of reducing um, topology up the span of the foot. So I don't want to have it traveling up the leg. So doing these uh, interesting sort of redirects at the bottom of the foot has really helped. Um, and it's also just coincidentally and just by accident really allowed me to get that arch structure into the foot as well, which is really cool. Again, uh, it's really down to the design of your foot, the design of your character, what topology you have to play with, and really taking the time to sort of dig yourself out of your own grave, essentially. <laughs> and some people might be a little bit peeved because I'm not doing that step-by-step -step breakdown of the foot. And I have to say this again and again, I think, um, again, starting from the start of this video series, uh, this was an intermediate series to begin with. And the idea is here for you to learn how to problem solve for character design issues, not just how to do things step by step, because you don't end up actually learning anything. If you just think that knowing the tools solves the problems, it's really about understanding the concept. So understand the concept first, then worry about the tools. All right, jumping into the abs, I want to add a little bit more structure to the abs because this is a great way of allowing you to uh, build out uh, form and volume into the stomach. So what I've done here, I've basically done an inset on a selection of faces around the sort of ab region going down to the crotch. And I've inserted, then pushed B on my keyboard to allow me to get that um, even inset working and then I'm just smoothing that out and the great thing about adding this loop in the inside of the abs is that it allows you to build out volume and structure if you have a character that is for instance maybe a bit chubby or you know pregnant and um, you know having that loop allows you to add spans along that loop to increase the volume if you need it so you can see that loop structure happening in the abs now and it also allows me to sort of structure out the rest of the hips as well. So when there's articulation happening there, it will crease at the right spot as well. And the proof will be in the pudding when I show you what we're going to do in video 10, which is going to be very interesting. And the reason why I consider this to be, again, an extra bit to do rather than a necessary bit to do is because unless you plan on having characters do you know, things like expand and contract, like had their stomachs get bigger or smaller, then it's not exactly necessary to build this sort of structure into the mesh. It will still deform perfectly well. It will still, you know, move and bend and twist in the way that you expect. So again, this is completely optional and you don't need to do it unless you want to. All right, last thing for the stomach, I am going to add a belly button into the geometry. Again, another inset, very simple sort of loop. And I just sort of structure that into that sort of belly button shape that you'd expect. And the interesting thing about male belly buttons and female belly buttons is that female belly buttons tend to have an oval shape that is sort of vertical in nature, whereas a male belly button tends to be horizontal in nature. So as, you know, that's an interesting thing that you can observe about human anatomy. And yes, of course, I understand that there are exceptions to the rule and it all depends on the physicality of that person. And of course, as I said about the abs, adding the belly button into the geometry is of course an optional thing you can do. I mean, this could easily be textured in. It's not exactly necessary to do this, but you know, I just wanted to add it in there cause it looked nice. And I'm now just sort of sculpting out the stomach using that extra geometry to sort of build out 
a very simple app structure. It doesn't require you to actually model in every little app muscle. You don't need to do that. You can actually fix that up with a little bit of sculpting and some very good texturing. You don't actually have to put in that geometry to get a decent six pack out of your characters. One last thing about the abs and that extra loop is that it also allows you to sort of structure out the lower rib structure, which is really cool as well. Okay, jumping into the teeth and tongue. And this again, I'm not really gonna show you the modeling process. I'm just gonna show you how I've managed to model my particular character's teeth because everyone does it differently and it all depends on the character design you have in mind. And you can see it's really simple geometry. It's basically just half a cylinder that's been sort of modeled to look like gums. And again, another half cylinder that's modeled to look like teeth. It's just, you know, really, really simple geometry. And then I kind of just subdivide that to smooth it out. It's not a complicated structure. And as you can see here, as I smooth it out, it just looks like teeth. And if you wanted to have teeth that are individually modeled, I would say just look at some teeth um, reference Look at the structure, look at how many teeth are required for the mouth and just model those teeth individually based on the structure. It's not a very complicated geometry underlying that. And this is actually one of those situations where I would say if you could find a free resource like a Turbo Squid or a Blender Market or a Blend Swap file that already has teeth modeled, just use that. I mean, you're just going to be wasting your time modeling that shit by yourself again. And there's so many models out there and because they don't deform all that much, um, finding teeth that has some pretty average topology isn't really going to affect the rest of the model or even the animation as you make it. So yeah, not a big deal to find average teeth or just model it yourself and you can be pretty lackadaisy about your approach with that. And again, the same method with the tongue, it's basically a cylinder that just has been sculpted to look like a tongue. Not that difficult here. All right, another thing that's optional and a little bit fun to do is the eyelashes. And my method is really straightforward here. Just select a series of edges that already exist on your eye, duplicate that edges, separate it and extrude. Very simple method here. And then just add a few loops to that eyelash structure to get the curve in the way you want it. And the great thing about this method versus just modeling out some eyelashes separately is that you have the same edge spans as the eyelid itself because that becomes really useful when it when you come to rigging because then you know exactly that if the um, the skin weights of the eyelid have to be a certain amount then the skin weights on the eyelashes have to be the same perfect isn't it then to add a little bit of thickness, I will add a solidify modifier and just get it down to a very small amount. Millimeters, probably like one millimeter even. It doesn't have to be a lot, but it's enough to get some nice light bounces off those eyelashes if you want to. I mean, honestly, you could have it just as a flat plane and not have to worry about it, but I like the little touches like this. So after you've done that, just tweak those verts. They're, there's not going to be a lot to play with, but if you do have to, just tweak them to get the most appealing eyelashes as you can. And I'm going to tell you now, it's absolutely crazy how much of a difference adding eyelashes does to a character. They go from looking like a creepy 3D weirdo character to someone that has actual life in their eyes. It's actually insane how much eyelashes makes a difference to a character. Especially female characters, by the way. Alright, last but not least, but um, definitely just as optional as the rest of the stuff I've shown here today. I'm going to add some procedural effects to the mesh. Um, and one of my favorite things to do is to add a bevel modifier to the underlying base mesh of my character. And I do that by assigning bevel edge weights to specific parts of the body. So one of my favorite parts to do that for is the fingers because I can get some nice blocky structures out of it. And it's really great for those sort of designs where you are going for stylization. I uh, think Wreck-It Ralph style fingers where he's like super blocky and chunky. 
So without adding actually any new geometry, I'm just going to assign these edge bevel weights and then use the modifier to bring in that extra geometry without really adding it to it. And of course, the great thing about having this effect instead of modeling it straight into the geometry is that if it doesn't look good, I can always turn it off or remove it completely. And you can see what the effect has done already by switching on the bevel modifier and assigning it only to work on those bevel weights that I talked about. I'm getting these really nice, sharply defined fingers. And you can add this to anywhere on the body that you think is necessary. Uh, other good suggestions would be the brow, the, uh, the character maybe. Uh, the nose bridge, lips, maybe the ears, uh, anywhere really that you think you could really benefit from this. And now the rest of this process is just about polish really, polishing up the model where you think is necessary and doing all the last minute tweaks that you think will really help bring that character a little bit more to life. So I'm just sort of flattening out the profile, the fingernails. I'm not actually going to model them in in this character, but uh, you could if you wanted to. You can actually extrude out these uh, this area, separate the mesh, and then sort of create fingernails that way. But otherwise, this model is basically finished. It's ready to roll, ready to be rigged, ready to be textured in any way that you wish. So let's have a look at the final result here. And of course, if you're planning on animating this character or getting it ready for rigging, make sure that you convert any curve objects into a mesh object so it can be weight painted accordingly. Anyway, back to the conclusion. Let's see the final result. And you may have seen this video earlier in our previous episode, but this is the final result. And I think it looks pretty damn good. So what have we learned out of all this? We've learned how to model with articulation in mind. We've built out our deforming mesh. We've created clothing. We've learned how to make polygonal hair that can be animated. And now it's at a state where it can be rigged, textured and animated, which is pretty damn awesome. So the last video of this series, I may as well tell you what it's going to be. It's going to be how to convert this character into something like this without any real extra modeling required apart from the clothing. So with the same underlying geometry, the same edge flow, the same, almost the same poly count actually, you can go from this to this really damn easily. So until then, catch us and have fun.